Go ahead. Um, hello, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining today's webinar. Um, my name is Betty and I will be the moderator for today. Please um, give me a minute to let just check our voice and sound. Welcome everyone to today's webinar on how to resource youth-led movements in the 21st century, organized by the amazing team at Civicus and its youth network. Um, my name is Betty Barka and I'm part of the youth action team. I am from Fiji and currently doing my PhD at Monash University in Melbourne. Um, today's webinar will last approximately 30 minutes. Uh, 60 minutes, sorry. And um, as you've already taken a look, we will be, we have a, f we have a great lineup of panelists. Firstly, we have Elisa Novua from Civicus, who will give us some background on um, why we should share, why we should care about resourcing youth-led organize organizing and why this is a priority for Civicus. Secondly, our second speaker will be the Director of Research from Recrea, Joel, who will share the findings of the landscape and trends analysis on resourcing youth-led groups and movements. This has been a priority and largely why we're uh, doing this webinar. And our third speaker from the Philippines will be Wilson, who is one of the 26 awardees of the Goalkeepers Youth Action Accelerator Program um, and sharing how this initiative is trying to provide resources better tailored for youth action um, globally. Um, I will introduce the presenters and pen presenters in detail before their, in before their uh, presentation. Um, they will between 10 to 15 minutes to present the content and share their learnings. At the end, we will have a question and answer session, so you will have time to um, reach out to the panelists if you have something specific. Um, please write down your questions in the chat box or in the comments on YouTube. If you're connected to us via social media on Twitter, feel free to write um, your questions and tweet to us. Um, uh, please use the hashtags, hashtag Civicus Youth and hashtag Shift the Power to share um, your questions and your learnings from this webinar. Um, also, on, on a very great and exciting note, as you can see, the excitement is very, very high. Everybody's pretty hyped up about this webinar and the comments are flowing through. Please let us know where you're joining from. We're very excited to know where you're joining from um, in the comments below. Um, there will also be, for those of you who would like to share the findings that we will share on this webinar, a recording will be made available after this session. So um, you won't miss out anything just in case you have to run off. We know, um, we know everybody's got things to do. Okay, so without further ado, I will start with our first panelist, which is Elisa. Um, Elisa is, has been leading Civicus um, Youth Work Stream since 2016. She does amazing work and she's been coordinating all of the engagement opportunities for young members within Civicus and advocates for meaningful youth par participation in civil society across the globe. In the last months, Elisa has been dedicated to co-designing and coordinating alternative resource mechanisms for youth-led organizations and young activists. So with that, Elisa, please, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Betty, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, as Betty said, I'm part of the and currently working in the youth team of the Alliance. And uh, today, I'm really excited uh, about this webinar. I think that summarizes lots 
of the work that we've done in the past months. Uh, so mostly I'm gonna focus on sharing why this topic is so important for you and why are so focused as our, one of our priorities around researching youth activists in, in this era. Um, so for those who are new to Civicus or are participating for the first time in a Civicus event, uh, a little bit of the background of what is Civicus. So it's a global network of civil society organizations, movements, and individuals that are working uh, together to, to strengthen citizen action and to promote our civic rights and, um, and democratic values. Right now, Civicus has over 8,000 members in more than 183 countries, and all, all these members, 25% are young people, so individuals under the age of 30, or also organizations who are working in, on youth and children's rights. So this, of course, has manifested in youth being a priority actor for Civicus, and not only in the recent years, but since the beginning, 25 years ago, we've been focusing a lot on how to create a meaningful space for young people to participate and be a great contributors for the fight for civic rights across the globe. So in the last years, with uh, Betty and all the US Action Team members, we've been advocating a lot around creating the space for meaningful participation and successfully through dialogues and open spaces, consultations, we managed to create a, a space for that and hear the needs of our youth members. And this is quite obvious, but we found out that one of the biggest barriers for youth participation in civil society is resources. And because we want to a, enable as much as possible all actors in civil society. We're focusing on these trends and analyzing and uh, and studying uh, thoroughly what is causing these barriers and what can we do differently. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of data from some of the research we found, um, uh, which, is, which is quite shocking. When we talk about researching civil society, we found out that, for example, just 1% of the official development assistance reaches local groups in the Global South. And when we talk about gl Global South uh, and civil society groups, in this dynamics, we find that more than 50% of the population in the hemisphere is under 30. Uh, that also has uh, concluded through findings of, uh, of research that we done through Civicus Monitor that the majority of the world live in a con in context where it's freedom for uh, to uh, sorry freedom of expression association and assembly is threatened and, and is manifested in ways where use as usually in the front lines when we see the cases of protest movements uh, and organizations, we see that numerous cases uh, of police brutality, media accusations, negative reputation, and family restrictions are quite always uh, focused and affecting young people. Um, other key statistics and, and numbers that we would like to highlight uh, through the research uh, in the past years is that our members have told us that they are working with annual budgets of less than 15 or even $10,000 per year, which of course raises questions about the sustainability of youth activism, the limited opportunities for change makers to fully contribute to the defense of democracy in, in, in their countries. Um, I hope the sound is okay. Or, okay. <laughs> and if I'm going too fast, please let us know. Um, so based on yeah, this data, this context, the alerts raised by members, we've been working with the Youth Action Team, which is an advisory group that works closely with Civicus. Uh, 
and they have been very vocal advocating and raising awareness of the challenges faced by young people and the struggles that their work faces on a daily basis. Not only we're talking about challenges in financial resources, but also technical and human capacity, um, which is very unique to the reality of their peers from adult-led organizations that might have more time, more support, more networks. Therefore, for Civicus, we have been leveraging our networks, our knowledge, um, and visibility within the funding community and the civil society in general to push for more and better resources for youth-led groups. So the idea behind this webinar and all that work we've doing in collaboration with some donors but also with some youth activists is to learn and connect more about not only realities but solutions and and hopefully have a support mechanism for uh, for young people to be better researched and support and be enabled to be the positive change makers that we want in civil society so now i guess you're wondering how exactly civicus is walking this talk. Uh, so most of uh, this is the is responded by the identity of Civicus. So what we do is first of all mobilizing in solidarity and calling the alliance in support. So it's catalyzing the voices of youth members to inspire and provoke the funding community through messages, good practices, and even using the um, the Brave Philanthropy Awards, so for those who don't know, Civicus celebrates every 18 months the Nelson Mandela and Grassa Michelle Innovation Award, where one of the categories is the Brave Philanthropy Awards, recognizing the work of some foundations who are taking the risk of funding um, non-traditional groups, those who might face um, constant restrictions and systemic discrimination because of the countries where they're working or the issues that they're defending. Uh, another way we are working um, and, and the approach we use is, of course, connecting and exchanging. So through the communities of practice and the affinities, affinity groups in Civicus, youth members and others have found the resources, the knowledge to find support from peers and exchange their learnings. And finally, through experimenting and sharing uh, ideas and being very creative in designing alternative approaches uh, with actors. So it's all about providing the space that will let us be more creative and braver uh, and imagine another uh, research mechanism. Um, so just to give you more examples or in a more concrete way, um, in the last years, for example, we've been focusing a lot in convening funders and activists. So in retreats, in a global conference like the International Civil Society Week, or these webinars where we're hoping to hear all voices and all realities of this systemic challenge of researching civil society. Uh, we've been also experimenting directly um, with youth in creating new alternatives and also mobilizing the resources of civics. So for example, for those who are already Civicus voting members, you know that there is a, a membership fee that everyone contributes to. Therefore, the idea is now to use these resources in a solidarity fund where all members can apply and it's also members who decide um, who should uh, be awarded with this in every term um, and then of course there's another, another mechanism very exciting but uh, dedicated mostly to activists on the front lines it's an emergency fund the crisis response fund that is supporting youth members and all other members who are social movement leaders or environmental rights defenders or um, advocates uh, feminist rights defenders etc etc who are being currently under threat and at risk that need ex uh, rapid 
funding uh, to continue their advocacy campaigns. Um, and then finally, we're also testing some alternative resourcing models within Civicus, just to respond to the um, to one of the biggest challenges of cell society is the sustainability. Uh, we know that the official development aid uh, is not going to to continue for a long time, and it's the time now to for civil society to question these models on where to find the resources to not depend only in philanthropy or bilateral funding, but test and explore some revenue generating activities or seed funds from a crowdfunding, a crowdfunding patterns, for example. So this is pretty much all from my side. I hope that that gave a um, big background, the reasons why this is such an important topic for civics and how are we approaching it. And Perfect. Any questions in the chat box? Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you so much for giving an overview of what Civicus has been doing. It's been very clear to all um, that Civicus has stepped up its uh, priorities in, and commitments um, in enhancing spaces for young people and also in better understanding the resourcing challenges and trends and opportunities for youth led groups and movements. Um, which will bring us to our objective around sharing key findings identified by Civicus in their latest research um, by our second panelist, Goel. Um, so Goel is uh, the director of research at ICREA, um, an organization that designs and implements participatory youth-led research. Goel is also a passionate action researcher who recently finished her PhD project on how different funding models affect organizational culture, as well as the quality of social organizations, internal and external relationships. Goel is leading Civicus's um, landscape and trends analysis on resourcing youth-led groups and movements. And, um, and she will be sharing her findings um, with us shortly. I am also, sorry, just before Joe, Goel shares her findings. I am following the comments on the YouTube video and we will try to make the presentations available to you in case your internet isn't working and we will be sharing the recordings of this um, to you after the, after the webinar. Thank you, everybody. Goel, on to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Is my audio good? Buddy, you can hear me? Absolutely. And you can see me. OK, perfect. So thank you so much for the introduction. And thank you, Elisa. I am really excited to share with you some of the findings and reflection from these last few months already, uh, putting our heads around resourcing youth-led groups and movements. And really, what I would like to do with you today is share some of the deepest <laughs> reflections that we've had so far around this topic and i hope this will be the opening of a much broader conversation that we will continue doing over the next few months so the first starting point of this reflection is that as elisa already hinted to youth-led groups and movement behave differently from other organizations so when we speak of civil society in general often we're not speaking about the behavior of um, youth-led groups and movements. So we, are, we were looking into what does it look like to, en to engage with resources considering this different, um, this different relationship that they have with their environment. And so the two questions that we are exploring are one, what are the challenges that youth groups and youth -led groups and movements are facing, especially in the two regions of Latin America and Africa, but also what is happening around this space. Is there, are there new organizational models emerging, new strategies, new ways to see things? And what does it look like in terms of long-term sustainability? And with that, we are intending the way a group or a movement is able to transform itself and sustain its, um, its capacity to create impact over time. So to start with, um, why are they different? I think Elisa already hinted to it, but 
we are talking about um, an environment where, first of all, youth group, you let the groups and movement tend to be tiny, and so very small budgets, and often informal, and often unregistered, and working with very different type of mechanism that organizations that we hear about when we're speaking about small, medium, or even large organizations. So we we also know that because of that it becomes harder to engage with donors i think those of you who are listening in, who are at the head of, of coordinating youth groups and movements will really resonate with how hard it is uh, to interact with donors and to attract funding but also i think youth has become such a buzzword in the last probably decade and so um, there is an international, there are international debates about youth, but often those spaces tend to be co-opted by young people who happen to have more privileges, such as they are able to speak English, have um, higher education, etc. Meanwhile, to also be engaging, while young people are engaging with groups and movements, we cannot forget that they're also, we are also trying to figure out our livelihood. And so social entrepreneurship has emerged as a new model that um, is looking to respond to that. Uh, young people are being particularly responsive to this new model. So here it's interesting to see how social entrepreneurship and civil society are like blurring and what different models are coming out. And finally, something that is very kind of uh, important to flag is that the funding available that says that is for youth is huge compared to the ones that is actually managed by youth. And so this is something that probably needs to balance up a bit more and more funding available to you can be managed directly by youth. So with this in mind, I just wanted to give you a head up that this, um, what we are discussing here is coming out of a series of uh, processes that we have been doing in the last few months, a series of 25 interviews, but also uh, a number of participatory workshops engaging a Civicus Youth Network. Maybe some of you have been engaging with those. And also a very uh, powerful day-long dialogue that we coordinated in Serbia for, during International Civil Society Week between donors and uh, youth, -led, uh, youth representatives. And that was very powerful to explore the quality of those relationships and how do those feels. It was a very intense day. <laughs> Um, we also did some desk research and finally I'm bringing in my PhD project to this study that was studying precisely this in the context of Colombia. Um, but uh, really, so this is not just a study of the last four or five months, but instead we have, there is more building on that. So with this in mind, today I think the most important thing that I can do is to explore the questions of why does it even matter? And I say this because there is such a tendency to say youth participation, youth participation, but I really want to stress that there is something particular and unique and important and why we should be resourcing uh, youth like groups and movements. And I would like to express it to you with, with a sort of metaphor, a theoretical approach um, of how I've learned to understand uh, youth organizations and groups and movements behaviors. So here we go. I've been imagining um, the beginning of a youth group or movement as this seed where there is a need to respond to, a vision, there is a certain energy, a connection among a group of people, and the seed starts sprouting. And as it sprouts, at the beginning, it almost needs nothing. And many, many of you maybe have been in that position. It's like, we can do things. We don't, we don't need money. We don't need much resources. We have an agency in what we, what we desire to do and what we can do. And as the seeds starts growing roots into the context and society and culture that the organization or group or movement is placed in, to grow, it starts looking for more resources. And here is where this is very important. When we're talking about arriving to funding, funding doesn't come alone. It comes with worldviews and practices that oftentimes do not align, do not feel in coherence with the way the group or the movement wants to grow. So the organization is faced with the challenge of saying, how much can I absorb to become who I am? How how do I become? Co how do I stay coherent while while growing, while absorbing resources? 
So what are these type of worldviews and practices that over and over in the interviews and workshops that I've carried out, it comes out that people do not accept? One is this valuing of relationships, of building relationships versus a sort of, I would say, obsessions with numbers and evaluation, showing results. And, and this sometimes feel very much intention, but as well a desire to collaborate with other groups, within teams, etc. And then, and on the other side, a structure of resources that tends to put organizations, groups, and movements in competition with one another, which many have felt as very unhealthy. Also, as leading a youth groups and movements, it, it requires lots of reflection, learning, and this feels in tension with the idea of the fast pace space of projects, um, doing them over a short period of times, and also having to cover overhead, so tending to maybe align more than one project and, and maybe getting overwhelmed with all the, all the doing. And finally, often teams want to work together within youth groups and movements, and yet there are more opportunities going for individuals, young, individual young people, fellowship, uh, social entrepreneurs, or in individual opportunities. And so we're also asking ourselves how and, and how those individual and collective processes interact with one another. So what happens when this organization is faced with the challenge, with all these challenges that I've discussed with you? Well, in the way I understand it, this is really when an organization is a group or a movement is having to grow into the, its root, into trying to find different resources that feel incoherent. And here there is tons of experimentation with alliances, with partnership, with working differently with, with other institutions. And here there is a lot of opportunity, but also there is, through this process, the way in which an organization becomes itself. And this is really what I, what I want to stress, the why it matters, is because this little plant, no matter how little, is going to produce very different fruits from the one that, from the app, from other organizations. And is this unique, um, this unique combination of resources, of visions, of practices that, is, that are going to also bring new seeds, new ideas, a new opportunity to experiment with how to do things differently. So something that, um, that emerges so much in, in the conversations that I've had is the concept of prefiguration. And maybe you have not heard the term, but when I describe it to you, many of you will definitely recognize the sensing of, of wanting to do this. So prefigure, prefiguring is to enact in the now a vision that we have for the future has been defined also as a process of learning hope is experimenting with what i want society to be in the way i'm doing and i'm being and in this sense when this happens with, with what this means in relationship with donors is that youth groups and movements over and over in my interviews have stressed that they would like for the quality of this quality of relationship to be to be representative of, of different ways of interacting, different power dynamics that can be transforming. And so this is a quote from one of my interviews that I wanted to bring up to because I think it expresses the sense. Founders care about how many, how many, how many, but some of this work is not really about how many. It's really about the quality of relationships that these youth are able to build with themselves and with their community as a result of the work. The quality of the relationship is so important for youth organization, or at least in our case. And with this, I think, again, really want to stress in this, in this talk that what I'm sensing in this study is that when we talk about sustainability and men who might be struggling with sustainability, there is nothing that is there is no organization that I spoke to, no group, no movement that says, we know how, how we imagine our, sustain our sustainability. Every single organization is in a constant process of experimenting, of exploring, of trying to find out what that looks like. And so 
in a sense, there is a sense of instability, but also a sense that something is emerging, that something new is coming up. And so it will require for us to, to also change the way we engage and the way we see ourselves um, in this process. I wanted to conclude with some tips and starting with youth-led groups and movements, there is a sense that, um, first of all, again, experimenting, 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 but also in the relationship with donors, um, the way the interviews I spoke with spoke about the relationship with donors is almost as a date, as a, a needing to, to really build that trust, be, build that engagement, be honest, be open. And sometimes it's, it's really hard to do that, but um, it allows to maintain to build those type of relationship that you need. So it's, it's in a way, it's finding a good thing. And also understanding which donors at some point you cannot work with because it's not, it's not, it doesn't work for you. Also, I think sustainability is used a lot, but every group and every movement can have a deeper engagement with, the, with this concept and saying, what does it mean to me? What does it look for me? And a lot of patience, a lot of patience. <laughs> I think we all need to have a lot of bravery and patience in this moment. And in, in terms of do donors, overheads, 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 overheads long-term funding, I think anybody who has been looking at this topic for more than 15 minutes will be able to advise donors that really there is such an importance in um, supporting youth-led groups and movements with overheads. But also really it's about listening, it's about understanding the local context and the day-to-day -day reality that a youth like group of movement might be facing and valuing and appreciating and at least this is the essence of what i'm trying to share the way um the way a particular youth like group of movement is working and what they're bringing and why their fruits and how their fruits are so juicy and they're bringing something new again it, this will require more flexibility and as well a lot of patience i think Something that I want to conclude on is that across all the workshop, the interview, this last four years of working with these organizations and exploring this topic, I found out that looking for funding, looking for resources, it is so, so hard and also so demanding that I think many activists and leaders are struggling with mental health, are struggling to care for themselves, to care for their groups. And so really stressing that this topic needs to be more on the forefront of our discussion so that we can look to what does it look like to prefigure a world in the now, in the relationship with donors and with ourselves, in which we are being more caring and really supporting um, the, the complexity of our work. And with this, thank you so, so much for, for listening. And there is an upcoming toolkit that we are designing to facilitate these reflections for both donors and youth organizations, in which are, we're going to be sharing tons of stories as well. And so if you have a cool story to share, please reach out. And if you, if you want to hear more, um, also, thank you so much. Thank you, Goel. Um, that was extremely extremely resourceful and very informative um, the comments on our channel are showing that everybody is very excited to um, read the toolkit and the research report um, i think we all agree that there were some very important issues that were brought to light around flexibility around being agents of change but not just agents of change, but agents of revolution and resistance as youth, as youth, um, youth, youth actors in the global arena, but also the very complex issues around care and what does this mean in the work that we do? Um, especially, um, please, as Joel has shared and Elisa shared earlier, this toolkit will come out. Um, we're still in the phase of preparing the toolkit and the finalizing.
using the research report it will be shared so if you're not already on civicus mailing list or the youth connected to the youth action team or on our facebook groups please connect um connect with us email the team um, tweet to us and we will share the details um but this also brings us to our final panelist and a very prominent example of what youth-led initiatives look like. And uh, now our final panelist for the day, and I'm very pleased to introduce to you all Wilson. Wilson is a researcher who is affiliated with the Network for Social Accountability in East Asia and the Pacific. Wilson is also um, a part of the Goalkeepers Youth Action Accelerator Advocate Program and is and is receiving support to advance his work on the fourth sustainable development goal. He is, do he is developing the app Check My School to empower citizens to hold their governments accountable to deliver quality education. Uh, Wilson will be sharing more about his resourcing model with us now. Wilson, all over to you. All right, um, thank you, Betty. Um, I am delighted to be with you today to talk about the Goalkeepers Youth Action Accelerator model and how its support mechanisms could help uh, guide the funding practices of donors, um, grant makers, and other actors who support youth-led actions. The Accelerator currently supports uh, promising 26 youth advocates who are using um, data in innovative ways to address global goals 1 to 6, local development challenges related to poverty, hunger, health and well-being, education, gender equality, and water and sanitation. This is basically a multi-partner initiative by Action for Sustainable Development, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Civic Institute Action Team, um, George W. Bush Institute, the Obama Foundation, and Restless Development to directly help address the challenges young people face in accessing sufficient and appropriate resources to meaningfully engage in development decisions and activities that affect their communities. So the, the accelerator has three components. One is funds, second is technical support or mentorship, and the last is networking opportunities. So let's start with funds. Um, chosen youth advocates are receiving funding valued up to 30,000 US dollars. And uh, we are free to identify the ways by which we want to utilize the fund to implement our projects. This is important because it shows how funders' recognition of the diversity of cultural, political, and even economic conditions under which we operate could help achieve our project objectives. The traditionally rigid and strict funding support with pre-identified and allowable items to be procured at some point could make the project implementation unnecessarily difficult. Funding institutions giving out unrestricted funds is, of course, an important step, but it is not enough. Funds alone are not assurance of success of the projects. This is reflective of many actors that either replicate or often repeat the same projects and activities over several years. This is where the technical support as a major component of the program comes in. So from the get-go, we are provided with technical support from the Accelerator Network. They have helped us in crafting and designing the action plan in Tanzania last January, up to the identification of milestones and developing tools and systems of monitoring and evaluations. This is a very this is very uncommon for any funder, let alone youth-led oriented initiatives. So two months ago in Belgrade at the International Civil Society Week, the Accelerator was, uh, we were also provided um, development professionals from Restless Development, the Project Everyone, the Global Change Makers, to train us on the data management, project management, and advocacy campaigns. The unique ability to provide the opportunity to reconvene, reflect, and reconnect as a cohort is invaluable to one's growth and the possibility of connecting with others beyond thematic, geographic, or even group issues. It challenges the common, you know, ones of interventions. And has, it has the potential to stimulate other ways of enabling youth organizing. So uh, we, are, we are essentially free to choose the mentors and most suitable trainings that would help us achieve the project outcomes. 
the accelerator program have earmarked a portion of the total grant to facilitate more advanced trainings. Uh, the trainings could happen either online or offline, depending on the interest and tactical strategies of individual youth advocate. A subcomponent that I want to share with you in relation to the technical support is what we call the check-ins. So this is basically a learning activity whereby um, the secretariat of the accelerator from Civicus and all the youth advocates, all the 26 youth advocates give updates and feedback to everyone about our own individual uh, project implementation. So we do this as regularly as possible. Now, um, there are at least two benefits when we do this. The first is that we identify the problems and the whole team can start working on them immediately instead of you know waiting for the end of project evaluation. The second is that we identify the best um, practices. We can know what works best and how other youth advocates can replicate such practices and how we could tell the story. It further strengthens different regional and thematic issues for identifying solutions and supporting each other as partners and not just as beneficiaries of the program. So um, the last important component of the accelerator is networking. The program has given us access to a huge network of youth advocates and development professionals who are similarly working on the global goals. Funding institutions should realize that providing an inclusive platform where youth advocates can, can connect and collaborate with, ad, with advocates within and outside the program is a real game changer. From our experience in, uh, in the Accelerator, networking opportunities have provided us with new ideas, innovative tools, outside of the box perspectives, and even additional funding despite variant challenges. Now, uh, while all these are happening, we've also learned some lessons along the line. The idea of funding institutions providing networking opportunities to youth advocates is pretty straightforward, except in practice. It is very hard to access funders that pro actively provide relevant networks most of the time. Many funders have inherited an operating culture which is an outcome based, with little to no consideration and actively supporting networking events. These are critical to showcasing work and impact for increasing scale and even building cred credibility. The program allows us to access these spaces, uh, opening up their offices, institutional credibility for us to have meaningful conversations in different advocacy and civil society spaces. Now, the good news is that this old culture is changing slowly with many hiccups but, and many setbacks, but it's definitely changing. Now, many funders now, like Civicus, have realized that networking opportunities actually provide the means for project to achieve their objectives. Now, uh, let me end with uh, two common pitfalls. Uh, next slide, Clara. With two common pitfalls in funding uh, youth-led projects. So what are these pitfalls? The first, uh, the first is the idea that funding alone is enough and that it will allow us to do so many things and solve all kinds of problems. Well, guess what? Funding, while an integral in this, in this even indispensable component of any program, is not a magic bullet that would accelerate all kinds of youth-led projects. So um, the idea that funding alone is enough is false, and we should not build on it. Youth-led projects should be allowed to advise which areas of support they need, and donors should be able to accommodate or at least create things for fulfilling the need. This sounds obvious, but um, you'd be surprised how detailed this happened. Next slide, Clara, please. Uh, so the second, the second pitfall is the thinking that we can avoid politics. So this is tweetable. So for those of you in Twitter, now for those of you who are already working on youth-led projects, um, we realize that at the core of it, it's about power. Who sets the agenda? Whose voice matter? So I think a, a, a real mistake that we can do in this in this work is that is thinking that we can do this work devoid of talking about politics and power. So in conclusion, what we know is that improving resourcing models can be an incredibly powerful tool to improve the structure and operations of youth-led civil societies. But we've also learned that it's very hard to do it well, and there are many challenges 
It is important to continuously test and learn to ensure that all voices and actors can be strengthened and enabled to do the critical work that they're doing. Um, we in Accelerator, we don't, we don't have all the answers. We have some aspects of the solution. We have some experiences. We have some lessons. So what we will need as we go along about doing it is a great deal of humility, of openness, of listening, of trying things out and learning from them. What we need is, is essentially a culture and a practice of learning, which is not afraid to admit failure or changing our minds and improving things as we go along. Um, I believe I have said what I can possibly say in 10 minutes. Uh, I will be happy to answer any questions later. So in behalf of the 26 goalkeepers, thank you very much. Thank you, Wilson. That was yep. brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, you've highlighted some extremely important points, which links us to donor commitments and priorities and about who sets the agenda and who holds the power. And I think part of that solution is actually our hashtag, which is shift the power and uh, shifting the power in, in the hands of people in, especially for youth-led organizations, the power should be in the hands of youth and how do funding models um, incorporate that and how can we change the narrative to be more accessible and enabling for youth-led organizations to access resources. Um, so thank you very much for highlighting that. I, as a moderator, have a brilliant panel who have uh, ended on time. So this allows us exactly 15 minutes for question and answers. Um, and we have had so many question and answers. I'm so sorry if we won't be able to answer all of them um, in the 15 to 20 minutes we have after this, but we will do our best. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask highlight three questions at a time and give our panelists some time to think it through and they can choose which ones they would like to respond to. Um, if at all you have any further questions, tweet it down to us um, or write it in the chat box on the YouTube uh, channel and we'd follow through. Just before we go into the question and answer session, I would like to highlight that the objective of this webinar was to share the key findings um, from our recent research on landscape and trends analysis on resourcing youth-led groups and movements, and to be able to discuss how these help funders and youth activists um, access better resources. It was also to present youth perspectives on resourcing challenges and opportunities, and also to share lessons from the two programs supported by Civicus, which we have tried to briefly incorporate within 10 to 15 minutes, but the programs are much larger. Feel free to go to the Civicus website to get further details and uh, subscribe to our newsletters. Become a member, join the movement, and we'll keep you updated. All right, moving on to the questions. So the first question is, do you know how much ODA goes to youth-led or youth-focused groups? Um, the second question is, did you look at any peer-to-peer -peer funding models for resourcing youth movements? Example, Global North Youth Activists supporting Global South Youth Activists. And the third question, which will be the final question for this segment would be, how can youth-led organizations invest in income degenerating activities, yet as per regeneration, they are not allowed to make profits? Um, so panelists, um, the questions posed to you are that. I'm happy to clarify, but if our um, audience members would like to cl provide further clarity, feel free to do so in the chat boxes. Our team is following up. Um, on to you, panelists. I'm happy to pick up um, to pick up to try to answer some a couple of them. Um, in terms of the peer-to-peer -peer models, 
Um, I think that there are some really interesting, really interesting models that are coming up. And um, also talking about peer-to-peer -peer within Southern organizations. And maybe I'll just give you a very, uh, a, a very quick example of it. Is an organization called La Mucura, it's Colombian. They do research on how art brings in, uh, uh, contributes to social transformation. They're also a band and they play music uh, to sustain themselves. And they recently launched their CD and the, the model that they use is to reach out to other organizations, um, reach out to other organizations and say, hey, we are, um, we are launching the CD and we're looking for support. Could you help us become uh, like a fairy godmother of one song? And so in a way they are looking for other youth organizations and small organizations to support them with small fundings to be able to launch their project that then will generate funding by selling CDs and also a book that they created. And this goes briefly to the next question, which is really an important point because um, it's something that we really want to advocate. It is absurd for donors to um, encourage organizations to start generating their own funding and don't be dependent. And yet, at the same time, um, ad forbid them from using them, from using resources to generate further resources. So I think this is an argument in, in the conversation that I've had, many um, interviewees that I spoke with were pretty upset about this point and found it pretty incoherent. So we're going to be exploring this point specifically in the, um, in the toolkit that we're creating. Wilson, maybe um, uh, or Lisa, if there is, I'll pass it on to you. Thanks, Goel. Um, Wilson, would you like to carry on? Okay. Hello, can you hear me? So, I can hear you, yes. Okay. Um, thank you, girl. Um, moving on, I think that's a very brief oversight. Wilson, would you like to add anything or can we go to the next set of questions? Yeah, perhaps we can go to the next set of questions. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, so before we go to the next set of questions, I think there's some really, really cool comments coming up. And one was around um, youth have all the answers and tools to navigate advocacy and donor engagements and opportunities meaningfully. Um, so these are some exciting ways that we can um, engage. And number two, top down donor beneficiary relations are the only way to engage um, youth led groups. Um, so, I mean, of course, there are many other exciting comments and we'll try to our team is constantly searching through the various comments to share these to us okay moving on to the next set of questions so the first one is would you be in okay so somebody's interested to know how much is being managed by young women as well as by young men given that their privilege have more ownership and management or power over the limited funds available. So just being able to see how much money goes towards young women and how much goes to young men. The second question is, um, uh, somebody's interested in hearing how donors can include youth movements and strengthen their capacity. That's brilliant. Um, sort of investing in youth in the long term. And the third question is, how can donors best support youth-led movements, especially young feminist groups? So. Um, those are the three for this round. Elisa, Gerel, Wilson, please feel free to take on the questions. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Betty. I'll be happy to respond on how can donors best support youth-led movements. Um, so, I don't know, please, uh, please 
uh, feel free to, to compliment. Um, but I think there are at least three key asks or key recommendations that we we have uh, analyzed and learned, and we would like to recommend to the donors community. Uh, first of all, it's about promoting diversity. We have to start walking the talk of diversifying our grantees as uh, funders. So reach out to non-traditional actors, understand their dynamics, uh, build relationship and trust with different groups that you usually don't wor uh, work with. And, and look at youth groups and all their, in, in their diversity. Uh, look to organizations and where youth is participating, so their strength and is complemented in different ways. Um, the second one is to make available a diversity of resources. So it's again what a Wilson was saying. It's not about only providing financial resources, but think about ways where donors can actually provide infrastructure or essential uh, elements such maybe internet or buildings or a place to work, uh, but also providing the opportunities to learn and build the skills and the technical capacity of activists. So diversifying those resources and supporting young actors to increase their networks, which will absolutely help in the sustainability of their work and the diversification of their partners. And the third one is letting go some power and visibility. We have seen a lot of conditions and constraints from the grant making organizations where the focus is in visibility and credit, while that is not the main focus and sometimes that requires a lot of time. So le letting that go and, and being more flexible and providing more support in a in a relationship based on trust will be the, the best way. Thank you, Elisa. Um, Wilson? Uh, I would like to answer the, question, the second question, um, how, how, how donors can include youth movements and strengthen their capacity. Um, I'm not sure if I have the direct answer to it, but I am inclined to think that um, it should be within uh, the program of, uh, of a certain project. I mean, uh, what I'm saying is that uh, certain resources has to be earmarked for you to be able to, to provide advanced trainings to, to project implementers and youth advocates. The plain fact of the matter is that these trainings, these networking opportunities, they always require some sort of resources. So it would be best if that can be included uh, systematically within the program or the project. Um, in Civicus, uh, I mean, in, in, in Goalkeepers Youth Action Accelerator Program, um, they have earmarked a portion of the total grant um, for advanced training. So this is where uh, us youth advocates would choose um, the uh, suitable mentors or the programs or the trainings that would best uh, work best for us. Um, um, the second is that they, they also provide um, networking opportunities. Um, I think funding institutions should realize that providing this sort of inclusive platform where we can um, connect and collaborate with, with other youth advocates and project implementers within or even outside the program is always a, a real game changer. From, from our experience in the accelerator, these networking opportunities have, have have provided us with, with new ideas. And this is what I'm saying a while ago. Uh, new ideas, innovative tools, outside of the box perspective, and even additional uh, funding despite uh, barren challenges. Yeah, uh, I hope I, I was able to uh, add something to the second question. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Wilson. Um, Joel, do you have any additions to make before I ask more questions? <laughs> I think you can go ahead. <laughs> All right, perfect. Thank you, everyone. Um, so unfortunately, we're coming towards the very end of our 60 minutes, and we might go slightly above. But these are the final set of questions. Um, uh, again, to reiterate, we will not be able to answer all your questions. But if you'd like to reach out to our panelists 
um, we will be sending you a recording and the contact details, and you can reach out to the Civicus Youth Action Team at any point. Okay, so one other question was, how can formal CSOs reach out to youth-led groups and movements? Um, uh, so how can forces unite and strategies be shared across civil society? Um, and the second question is, how do we reach out to youths in rural areas? They do not have access to internet, are not educated, but yet constitute the bulk of the youth population. And the final question um, is about, as a youth leader, we are faced with funding problems. How do you think a grassroots civil society organization can entice funding? So over to the panelists for the final round of answers and yeah, concluding comments. Maybe I can start. Um, maybe I'll, I'll pick up the first question of how can formal CSOs reach out to youth-led groups and movements. I think this is an important question and in the experience and the stories and the work that I've done so far, my understanding is that uh, there need to be very different way of interacting with an organization. So diversifying the way the the, the programs, the mechanisms, the type of uh, the type of way and in, in youth organizations engages um, with them, and that I think most importantly, it needs to be it needs to be in conversation. There cannot be a fixed way to go about something and then just do it no matter what. There needs to be more of a dialogue around, um, around how this relationship can evolve and there needs to be experimentation and the, the more established organization needs to be flexible, but also there needs to be um, uh, a sense that we are co-creating something constantly. And I think Civicus, uh, our experiences also with Civicus has been very much of, of trying to do that and facing the bumps of interacting with bureaucracy and interacting with the complexity of interacting with a bigger institution as a smaller organization. And I think that, um, I think that we, there is a lot of learning to be done. Uh, so we are in a moment where this learning is being done. And so experimenting and reflecting on the learning, I think, would be the most powerful thing that organizations can do. Thank you, girl. Um, Wilson, would you like to add anything? Yeah, uh, I'd like to to make a comment on the on the um, third question: how 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 can a grassroots civil society organization can entice um, funding? I think uh, in in most of the project, at some point, we will we have all encountered uh, problems on funding, and um, there mean there are a lot of ways on how you can how can how how you can entice more funding one is uh by storytelling and this is has this has been emphasized in the accelerator program um there's this thing called um the most significant change framework so if you want to google that out so it's basically a framework where it's it's the beneficiaries that would tell the stories uh the 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 the, the plain fact of the matter is that usually um grassroots civil society do not have a direct access to funders so perhaps through different means of telling the story through through a video or through an article we can reach those um we can reach those funders most of the time even even funding applications are only by invitations so if you don't have a direct contact to those funding institutions then you, you lose the chance but if you can develop a or if you can package a very good and solid um, communication materials about your project, about the progress that you're doing in, 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 in your community, then that would be a good way to go. The second, the second way that I could recommend is um, perhaps we get, it's also high time to think of um, developing entrepreneurial ways to come up with funding. The traditional way on how civil society organizations get their funding is through grant applications. Um, but sometimes, uh, even even now, um, um, uh, there, there, uh, the opportunities are becoming fewer and fewer. So I think it's also best for youth-led uh, civil society organizations to think of uh, entrepreneurial ways on how they can get more funding. Um, most of you can do research. 
then perhaps you can you can offer that as a consultancy. Um, you can you can also give trainings. You can also organize learning events, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in that way, you also get um, um, some additional resources that could even accelerate your own projects. So I I, I guess that's it. Uh, I hope I was able to answer the second question. So telling the story and um, thinking or developing the grant application. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Wilson. Uh, maybe I can pick up the second question about rural youth. And uh, I think this is a really important question and a complex one. And maybe I will not be answering your, uh, your question because it's a hard question, but I think that I can provide some insight based on my reflections. And um, I think that often right now there is, a, there is a tendency to talk a lot about entrepreneurship and I think social entrepreneurship and as a way to generate some fundings, et cetera. And I think that I want to flag that we need to be careful also about uh, how, we, how much we understand uh, how much social entrepreneurship can be useful and, and put it in the right place. Because, for example, I've been working um, a lot with youth organizations in, and groups in Medellin and in Colombia. And something that comes out as a strong challenge is that for those organizations that are coming from um, either rural context or more un underprivileged, underprivileged background where you are not able to necessarily uh, have a market for your products in a very accessible way, um, it becomes really hard to generate or, uh, our own revenues. And so what this means is that, especially in rural areas, I think donors can really take a step up and support and, and provide um, access to, for example, this type of webinars, resources, etc. And that, um, so I think um, this is not to say, of course, we, we, we have a sense that we need to step out of being dependent from donors, but I think that there is definitely spaces where donor support is so, so important. And I think in rural areas is particularly important. And so just wanted to stress that um, it's something to keep in mind. Perfect. Thank you so much, Carol and Wilson. Um, uh, just to add on, and unfortunately, this is going to be we're, we're co we've come to the end of our webinar, um, but we've learned so much. And as with most things, we will not be able to cover a lot of ground. But in this webinar, we've covered so many things. So many answers have been um, given around trends and opportunities and challenges and how, and best practices. I think I would just add on to the question number one, which was left around how can formal CSOs reach out to youth-led groups and movements? And I think one of the best answers for that is join membership institutions like Civicus, which are civic spaces, safe spaces for civil society. And they have prioritized youth-led initiatives. Um, and so joining, becoming a part of the movement like, and being a part of spaces such as Civicus does allow some opportunity. Of course, it does come with it consequences. There are limitations to organizations such as reaching out to the rural community, people who are not connected. Translation has always been a challenge and continues to be, um, but uh, Civicus functions in a lot of languages and depend and has sub-regional focus. And I think, I think it's just very important to be able to, as youth activists and as youth leaders, we have to take it on ourselves to create enabling and accessible spaces. If we have access to opportunities, we need to be able to share with our networks. We know that these are the best ways forward. Um, and strengthening our networks and growing them is what works best for us. So if at all, we have any concluding comments from the panelists, please do so. But I'm afraid, thank you everybody so much for joining us. This has been a great webinar and, and we look forward to hosting other webinars. So if you have an exciting topic or if you want to know about something exciting or think that something has been left out and would like to hear more about it, please reach out to us. Um, please reach out to Elisa and,
uh, the Civicus team, you can write to us at youth at civicus.org. You can tweet to us at Civicus with the hashtag Civicus Youth, and we will respond to you. Um, Take a look at the youth action team, reach out to people there. I'm sure Goel and Wilson would be happy to uh, respond to a few emails if you have questions that remain unanswered for you after this webinar. Um, thank you all once again for joining the webinar. We truly appreciate it. And we will make sure to keep you updated on the recording of this webinar and the presentation, and as well as the research report and the toolkit when it comes out. Thank you all very much. That's adios from our end. Bye.